Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Lion Knights. Our two principal lion knights, Gus and Doug, have just learned that five of their fellows have taken service with the dwarf Finner Kolkam, Finner the Golden Hand. And in return, he has given them their forms back, their original human forms at the price of 14 years' service. Suddenly, Fletcher was between the cat captains and their now human men. Doug and Gus had known Fletcher for some weeks. They had seen him cheerful, calm, detached, and stern. For the first time, they saw him scowling. Take me to this Finner Colcam, your new master. Derek was used to being as tall as Fletcher. Now, Derek human, Fletcher was more than a foot taller. He glanced nervously from the centaur captain to his own familiar captain monsters. Gus just glared. Do it, Doug snapped. Soon, Fletcher and the Lung Mao poured out of the gates, Charlie Horse drawn along by sheer curiosity. Fletcher had demanded to be taken, but he seemed to know exactly where Cunning Street was without guidance. This left the others time for... discussion. Fourteen years, Gus expostulated. Holy crow, what the actual... Before Gus could break his personal vow against swearing, Derek interrupted, But we get to be us! And we're immortal, protested Firaz. What's fourteen years? It's still a hundred and sixty-eight months, Charlie answered, almost three times as long as you've been transformed lived through an hour at a time. What about getting home? That's what I said, Rahul put in. Dan and me, we want to see our families. These five, not so much, I guess. Fletcher was moving at an angry, fast walk on horse legs. The Wong Mao, human-shaped or not, jogged to keep up. Jose moved up to trot next to Doug. He took off his ring and deflated. Doug noticed that he never broke stride. Here, he said, holding out the ring on his palm to Doug. Try it. Doug stared at it. It was a thick bronze ring, and it seemed to glitter when, on second glance, it did not. His newly trained magic recognition said it was very magical. His breath accelerated beyond the need of the jogging. Why? Because you've been good to us for five years, looked out for us even when we were slaves together, I want you to, to enjoy this, you and Gus. Doug took the ring and slipped it on. Nothing happened. A confusion of horror and disappointment started to build up in him, but then came Charlie's voice from behind them. It will only work for Jose, sir. Jose, may I see the ring? When Jose nodded, Doug passed it to Charlie. Ah, see the symbol on the bezel? Charlie held it out. A mark like a Greek lambda was on it. That could be the Tenguar letter Hjarnan, the H sound. Your initial, Jose. Your rings are personalized. A seeming like this, but general purpose, that would be much harder, take much longer. The dwarf couldn't knock off five in one morning. I'm surprised he could do what he did. He's very good, Fletcher growled from the front of the pack, but also he had them ready. He wanted you lot, before you ever set foot on his street. Otherwise, why not hire locally? He must have heard about you, then got to work with some foretelling or pixie leading. What's special about us? asked Jose, taking back his ring. I mean, I know we look different, but he's got gin and stuff he could hire. They must be just as tough or tougher. The locals, Fletcher answered coldly, are protected by local contract laws. He paused, wheeled to face his followers, and asked, What have you signed? Uh, we haven't signed anything yet, sir, Derek answered. He just made us swear. He said it was part of the magic for the rings. Swear? By what? 
by, by our good names and our honor as soldiers. Mathir, he said, warriors. He, he was speaking Sindarin. Fletcher advanced on Derek and held out his hand. After a moment of confusion, Derek took it. Fletcher stared into his eyes. Yes, oath-bound. Then it was Fletcher's turn to look confused. He scanned the humanized cat men. Why are you not catatonic or berserk? The slightest whiff of mental influence from Randorell when he just suggested peace all but sent Doug and Gus and Rob into a battle frenzy. A solid binding oath should... He fell silent. Derek puzzled a moment, too, then said, Well, it's okay, sir. It worked out. It didn't hurt, and it's what we wanted. Ah, that's it, I think. It didn't hurt because it was what you wanted. Magic is all about will. Will to do, will to know. It looks like the psychic wounds you bear from your war lady don't bite when mental magic moves according to your will and not against it. Hmm. And, uh... He looked about. The street was reasonably wide by local standards, but two centaurs, four lungmao, and five regular guys, all in discussion, caused congestion and curiosity. He moved the group over to the side, where the congestion, at least, was abated. Once he had his impromptu class about him, he resumed. I'm still wroth with thinner gold hand, and for the same reason. You have been grossly overcharged for those seeming rings. You do realize you're wearing seemings, don't you? Not real transformations? What's the difference? Derek asked. How does your tail feel? Fletcher returned. Uh, like nothing? Like nothing is touching it, or like you don't have a tail? Never mind, too delicate a distinction. Well, the difference. First, I saw you shift from one form to another back at base very casually. True transformation... When you were transformed, you were given new muscles for your ears and tail, and they were wired into your brain with new nerves, and new motor centers grew. That was confusing, wasn't it? I know. Fletcher swept his hand back along his own flank. You don't flip back and forth between shapes like that casually, not until you're an experienced shapeshifter. Second, a seeming basically tells the subject, you, to appear otherwise. And you do, including size and palpability, but it's still just appearing. When the seeming stops, when you take off the ring, you go back. Which brings me to the third point. When you're more practiced at feeling magic, you'll be able to feel the seeming running, keeping you in that form. No spell keeps me this way, or kept you, keeps you in lung mal form. The magic shaped you and was done. I can feel the seemings running here running off your energy, by the way. It'll make you tire a little quicker to wear those rings. Finally, a true shapeshift is orders of magnitude more involved than a seeming. Thinner is good, but I don't believe he's that good. So rest assured you have been given seemings. Very good ones, but seemings. He didn't say they were shapeshifts, did he? He just sort of said, try this, you'll like it. And I do. We do. Fletcher nodded. But not at the price of fourteen years. Oh, and here's a good thing about your oaths. You swore by your good name and your honor. That's a very standard oath for armsmen in these parts, especially when there's no common religion. But it means that the oath does not bind you to do anything sinful or shameful or criminal. We'll see what else we can do. Come along. Cunning Street was twice as broad as most streets and busy. Finner's storefront was one of the largest on it, a wide counter under a canvas awning. Above, on the frame of the awning, curling tanguar letters of wrought iron read, Finner Panmirden, Finner Allsmith. At the center of the counter, behind a bench thick with tools, worked Finner himself, just as bulky, brawny, and beardy as Derek had described him. He labored away at some tiny thing, crouching over it in a nest of instruments, but still kept up continual conversation with the onlookers, like a rumble of surf, joking, bargaining, gossiping, arguing. 
Like everyone else, he looked up when Fletcher and his followers arrived. His gaze swept over the group, then settled on Fletcher. Well, Adenroch, manhorse, are you here for a shoeing? he asked in loud cinderin. A little chuckle ran through the crowd. They would be the finest shoes ever I wore, Fletcher answered with unsmiling courtesy. But no, I am not here to talk about how you make objects, but about how you make bargains. With these, Finner asked, waving at the five human-looking Lung Mao. The bargains are made, the oaths are spoken, they wear the rings I gave them. Bargains can be unmade, oaths can be absolved, rings can be returned. The five now looked uneasy. These are young men, in desperate case, and strangers. Does not heaven teach through every religion in the city to be kind to strangers? And they are under our hospitality, Grand Normandies, and especially mine. How have I been unkind? I have restored their forms to them and given them jobs. Do you say you have a prior claim on them? Are you here to contest me for their oaths? He smiled put down the gold-tipped tweezers he was holding and reached under his bench, presumably for a cudgel. Do you threaten? I warn you, old plug soldier, I can break every one of your legs from here. They may not shoot you for being lame, but I can see to it you never walk straight again. Finner's human assistants came and stood behind their master. Two of the cloud statue sendings started toward him. A chatter ran through the onlookers, humans and a couple of jinn, who backed away but did not flee the promise of a spectacle. Doug and Gus were nearly knocked down as Charlie Horse brushed past them to stand by his captain. They recovered their balances and followed him. Foolishness, said Fletcher, and sat his hindquarters down, folding his arms and looking immovable. A moment later, Charlie copied him. Doug and Gus flanked them and stood at parade rest. These young men are my friends and in my charge, Fletcher said. I merely want to see them fairly done by. You sold them seemings. But the price, he shook his head. Let us discuss it. The crowd drew in a little. The chaffering was not as spectacular as a brawl, but you could stand closer. Finner, though, dropped his smile, along with any cudgel that might have lurked below his bench, and growled, Not here. He waved back his assistance with one hand. With the other, which flared golden in the sun as he swung it, he waved Fletcher toward the entrance. Fletcher beckoned for the others to follow. Well, Charlie murmured to Gus and Doug, score one for our side, maybe two. Fletcher defused his fight and dared him to talk about his bargaining in front of everyone, and he backed down. They skirted the counter and followed Finner through a shadowy doorway. This led by a short corridor to a courtyard largely shaded by white linen awnings. It was clearly Finner's display floor. Flanking the door were long, low tables covered in white linen. On the cloth were arrayed pieces of jewelry, mostly gold and electrum. At the far ends of the tables rose steel chains tipped with swords. They held themselves up, swaying slightly as the visitors entered, like serpents. More tables occupied the edges of the courtyard, interspersed with the guardian sword chains. One bore a variety of elegant candlesticks and candelabras, wrought in silver, copper, and bronze, already furnished with metal candles alight with flames of blue, green, red, yellow, or violet. Another table bore lockets and rings, but not decorative ones like the ones at the entrance. Rather, they were sturdy, made of bronze or steel, clearly tools of some kind. A third table was full of swords and daggers, mostly steel, but sometimes of copper or black or blue metals. Another table bore goblets and chalices of silver, gold, and electrum, beautifully gemmed and enameled, and so on. And everywhere, for those who could catch it, was the trace of magic, strong and bold. Fletcher immediately recognized its tang as Finner's own. He made no remark, but followed Finner to the sunny center of the courtyard, where cushions and rugs were arranged around a raised bed of yellow flowering cacti. 
Finner sat on a cushion, and Fletcher settled on a nearby rug. The young men, in their various forms, stayed in the shadow of the awnings, a tense audience. Charlie attended his captain. Gus and Doug stood between Finner and their men. Fletcher began, So, Finner Kolkam, son of C.R., son of Sindri of the Seven Kingdoms, have you not heard that generosity breeds generosity? Yes, have you not heard the laborer is worthy of his wages? You should certainly be paid for the seeming rings, and they are excellent, but they are not worth fourteen years' service. Do you wonder how I know? This fellow, Fletcher put a hand on Charlie Horse's human shoulder, Charlie tried not to look surprised, was given his form by the cavalry's chief mage. I was given my form by that mage's uncle. True transformations, as you no doubt perceive. These are now our real shapes. We are shot with an enchanted arrow. Our mage can turn out twenty such arrows every year, and yet spend most of his time acting as our physician, doctoring horses, analyzing magical objects we bring back from our explorations, and in his studies. True shapeshift, not seeming, yet he is mortal. You are I know not how many centuries old, and known to be a master of many crafts, especially of many magics. How hard can it have been for you to create the rings that gave these lads their old appearance back? The proper question, Finner answered, is how much it is worth to these men to get their proper forms back. It is not worth fourteen years' service, when with proper teaching they could learn to shapeshift themselves in a few weeks or months. And how do you know that? I am not as old as you, but I have seen much and I have discussed the matter with our ship's magic officer, who was an Alda. I tell you, it is best for you as well as for them to reduce their time in your service. You do not ask me to absolve their oaths? No, they wanted to take service with you, but they had no way to know a just price for their seemings. Fletcher turned and gazed at the five Lungmao. Jose looked sour. Derek glared at Finner. The others looked worried. Now they know. If you leave their term of service at fourteen years, they will know they were overcharged, and what kind of servants will you have? And Grand Normandy will know you overcharge, and through us the city will know. Thinner reddened, and teeth appeared in his beard. It was no smile. Fletcher carefully did not smile. He continued calmly, But if you reduce their term, no such gossip will fly. At most, some people will see that you valued these lads so much you were over-eager at first to contract as much of their service as you imagined possible. But these people will also hear you relented. Generosity breeds generosity. Finner stewed for a few seconds, then rumbled, How long do you think just? Three years. Three, nine, four, Fletcher countered. Five, five then, Fletcher agreed. But they get Sabbaths off and holy days when at all practical. Which holy days? Fourteen a year that you reach by mutual agreement. And they have the same rights in court as any citizen armsman. And you teach them shapeshifting or get a teacher for them. Think of it as an investment. And they have the right to use the Grand Norman males to keep in touch with their brothers in arms and their families and us, or anyone else. Deal? Deal. I swear it by my good name and my skill and my power. Good. Fletcher turned back to the Lung Mao and addressed them in Sindarin. Gentlemen, I give you ten minutes to consider the new terms. If you are not satisfied, we start over. I am in no hurry. Doug let them mutter among themselves for half a minute, then waded in among them. Are you guys okay with this? he asked in English. Because I bet Fletcher could get this dwarf mage to drop the whole thing, if you want. Look how fast he got him down to five years from fourteen. No, it's okay, said Derek. We wanted this. We even wanted it back when it was fourteen years. Don't you see? We get to be us again. Drop the monster thing, even if it's kind of fake. But you're enzillion miles from home. Doesn't matter. We five, none of us have strong family ties. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't have been in Baghdad looking for work as military contractors. Doug knew that to be true. But you can learn to change for real, he pointed out. Someday, neither Randurell nor Fletcher can say when. This, Derek held up his hand, showing the ring, is now bird in the hand. It's a lot sweeter deal than Husband, especially now that Fletcher's polished it up. He held out his hand. Don't worry, Captain. We'll be fine. They shook, and Jose pushed up to offer his hand next. Goodbye, Captain. You did good. You got us through. I'm real grateful. We all are. The others gave a ragged chorus of agreement. As they turned to Gus for his round of handshaking, he told them, Right! Fletcher got you that. Use it! Then sotto voce, though this was needless since he spoke to them in English, if you get in trouble with this Finner dude or with anyone, go to the Grand Normans. He can't stop you, oath-bound. Write us, sure, but the Grand Normans are already here, and they'll back Fletcher. The trouble are not right, so I know you're okay. Gus gave a long stare to each of them, fixing their restored faces in his memory, then turned away. Doug and Gus walked slowly back to the Netsock Isis base, Fletcher beside them. Behind trailed Charlie Horse, Rahul, and Dan. Doug scuffed at the road with his boots as he walked, eyes downcast. I feel like I've failed. You haven't failed, Fletcher asserted. You are only dumb. I think I know why we feel that way, though, said Gus. All that time on the road, we were always counting noses. Have we got them all? Have we got them all? We'd get lost in a forest or chased by bandits or farmers or a job would turn into a brawl in a city. And as soon as we could, it was, have we got them all? And the nose count again. And now, well, we don't. Doug looked up and sighed. I wonder if we'll ever see them again. Certainly you will, Charlie assured him. Ever is a long time, and you will see all of it. But yes, your time on the road together is done. That's not a bad thing, surely? Not entirely? To be done with homeless wandering and, well, more uncertainty than I can really imagine? You've done well, Fletcher assured them. More than well. No casualties. Think if you had lost one of them, had to bury him, for him to wake up in however many years even more confused and now alone. You prevented that. Okay. Thank you, sir. But I miss him. Fletcher thought of all the friends and students he missed and said nothing. So much for their adventure in Netsak Isis. But they aren't home yet, and we'll see where they go next time.